Okay, thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome, and I'd like to uh, say that I'm really pleased to be here now as the Director of the National Immunisation Office. Thank you to all of those uh, who I've met already who have made me very welcome, and thank you to Dr O'Keefe uh, and her team in terms of making me welcome in the uh, organisation. Uh, as Kevin said, uh, obviously I've not been here for very long, but I have uh, some experience in, in uh, the UK before that, um, so we're sort of uh, going to be talking about some of those things. I'm so glad everyone can be here. I'm so glad that we've got... Uh, the IT equipment to be able to make this uh, available across the country uh, and to have practice nurses and GPs here as well. Uh, so that's great. I would really appreciate your feedback to see if it works and if you think this is a good thing to do again at some point. Um, and also in terms of, uh, we've had a lot of people already talk about how you as the healthcare workers are the most important people here uh, in terms of encouraging immunization uptake. So I think it's really important. We've now seen uh, of a range of infectious diseases that are vaccine preventable. We've learned about the epidemiology in, North, in Ireland and and uh, now uh, we've learnt about how um, severe the, the diseases can be. And now I'm just going to move on to talk a little bit more about making uh, sure that you guys are confident when you're actually administering the vaccine and you understand about administering the vaccine. So hopefully together uh, that that will uh, help to encourage uptake across the country. And as other people have said, even if you don't think this is relevant to your role, maybe you never see pregnant women, you never see uh, small babies, but you do have friends and family, and it's always important uh, to be the vaccine champion uh, across uh, all of your uh, roles in life. So we particularly picked rotavirus and the pertussis vaccine for these presentations because they're vaccines that we don't think the uptake is as good as maybe it could be, and maybe people aren't so confident uh, in giving those vaccines to people. So first of all, in terms of rotavirus, um, you're aware already that it's a highly infectious disease and we've talked about that. Most children will have at least one rotavirus infection um, and although it, only, uh, it can last for three to eight days but it can be very serious and people can need to be hospitalised for it, particularly the small children. So in terms of the rotavirus vaccine, as we've heard, it's actually been around for quite a long time in lots of different countries already. And in the UK, it was introduced in 2013. In the UK, uh, they give it at two and three months of age. And the uptake was very high very quickly. So in England, it's 90%, but in Northern Ireland, it's actually 94%. Uh, and it's been noted, actually, it's about 1% lower than the uh, uptake of the primary immunizations. And that was always thought because of the cutoff uh, and that that 1% of people were only not coming in because they were too old by the time they were uh, coming in for their vaccinations. When we introduced it in Ireland in October 2016, in Ireland it's given at two and four months of age, and the uptake on average is 89%, but it's very, very variable. It's between 81 and 95%. That's a huge variation. And when we look at some of the data, we can see actually some parents are selectively refusing the vaccine, which uh, was never really a thing that was noted in the UK when it was brought in. It just sort of slipped into the, the program. It's an oral vaccine. No one was really particularly worried about it. So as Kevin was saying, we'd be really interested uh, from yourselves in the field as to why these parents are selectively refusing the vaccine. What is the thing that they're concerned about that we need to be able to influence them to encourage them to have confidence in this vaccine? So this is some data from the UK. You've seen the Irish data, uh, and you've seen how it already seems to be a very effective vaccine. And this is just showing, obviously, the UK have uh, some more uh, years of experience in this, and you can see how it's completely flatlined in terms of the number of cases. That seasonality has completely gone away. And again, this is just split down uh, between the under fives and the over fives. You can see the massive effect in the under fives, and also uh, effects in the over fives as well in England, England and Wales. So in terms of the rotavirus vaccine, we use this vaccine called Rotorix. It's a live attenuated vaccine. Uh, it's very much only for oral use. It comes in a little syringe at the moment, but you can't fix a needle on it in the hope that you can't give it in any other way except orally, although I do know very occasionally people have tried. Uh, and actually, for vaccine safety purposes, the company is trying to move to a squeezy tube uh, across Europe, and eventually probably uh, Ireland will move to a squeezy tube rather than a syringe, so you really, really can't give it any other way than orally, hopefully. Uh, we do know because it's a live vaccine, it is a little bit more complicated, and we do get an awful lot of queries for the NIO about the rotavirus vaccine. Can I give it because of this? Can I give it because of that? So what we've done, and you've each got one in your pack, and it's come uh, hopefully all to GPs as well, is a frequently asked questions. These are questions that we get all the time, uh, and hopefully if you have a look at that and keep that with you, that should answer most of your questions about rotavirus vaccine. Most children can have the rotavirus vaccine, uh, but if you keep that with you, hopefully that will help you uh, in terms of giving it to the right people. No, it's not moving on. Oh, there we go. Um, so our schedule, like I said, is usually at two and four months. And if you're doing a catch-up dose, if the children are a bit older, you need to leave four weeks apart at least. 
And we have the cutoff age in Ireland of eight months. So you can't give a second rotavirus vaccine if the child is eight months and zero days or older. And you need to have left at least four weeks before the first dose. So if the baby comes in and they're eight months and one day, uh, or eight, eight months and zero days or older, they can't have any doses of rotavirus vaccine. Now, because it's live, there are a bit more contraindications than other vaccines. Uh, so we're just going to go through those uh, briefly. So they're split essentially into three different categories. There are some that you're totally familiar with with all uh, other vaccines. You can't give the vaccine if someone has had a confirmed anaphylactic re reaction to a previous dose of that vaccine or anything that's in that vaccine. And very similarly, the vaccine contains sucrose. So people with these very rare hereditary problems around sucrose and fructose, they can't have the vaccine either. So that's the category of the vaccine constituents, which you should be sort of familiar with. We do also know, and that's why there is a cutoff age for uh, the rotavirus vaccine, that there is a slight increased risk of intersusception. And that's when one part of the large bowel uh, slots into uh, another part of the bowel and uh, can cause a, a bowel obstruction. That's a treatable thing, but it's something that we wouldn't want to uh, happen too often. So we want to uh, make sure that we have that cutoff age for the vaccine. But infants with a previous history of intersusception can't have the uh, vaccine. And again, that's why we have the cutoff dose of seven months for the first dose or eight months or over for the second dose to try and make sure that we don't have an increased uh, as association with intersusception. And similar to that, uh, any infants who have a malformation of the GI tract that might predispose them to intersusception, they also can't have the vaccine. Uh, now, some it probably is best if someone has had bowel surgery, you might well want to check with the consultant that did that surgery to see if they think that that child can have the rotavirus vaccine. And then the last category is people uh, who have a, a possible uh, immunocompromising conditions, again, because it's a live vaccine. So infants with severe combined immunodeficiency can't have the vaccine, and you need to delay the vaccine in babies born to mothers who have had some of these immunomodulating therapies. And you can see that in the NIAC guidance, and you can see it in our frequently asked questions. But most babies wouldn't fall into any of these categories, and most babies can have the vaccine safely. So in terms of adverse reaction, there is research, like I said, that the rotavirus vaccine may be associated with a really small increase of risk and interception within seven days of the vaccine. So less than two cases per 100,000 doses given. But the so data from the UK shows that it averts 50,000 hospitalizations for gastroenteritis each year. So in terms of the risk benefit, uh, it is very much uh, on the benefit side of having the rotavirus vaccine. We do know there are some common adverse events as well in terms of administration. So more than one in 10 babies may have some diarrhea and some irritability, but that would be short-lived. I then just wanted to, to go over a couple of sides of pertussis vaccine as well in terms of the administration of it. So for pregnant women, we've already heard in terms of uh, pertussis in infants that it is very serious uh, and hospitalizations are more common in the under six months of age. Uh, Helen's going to come and talk about more experience in the UK for that. But in terms of, as Kevin was saying, some of us are previously pediatricians. I remember seeing a very small baby in hospital having coughing fits and then uh, turning blue and how terrified the mother is. And I just think it was really important to make sure that we can stop that happening to other women. And as you can see from the data that Desmond presented, most of the cases of under six months in Ireland, the mother hasn't been vaccinated in pregnancy. So really important to encourage pregnant women to be confident to come forward and have the vaccine in pregnancy. So why do we give it? Well, it provides protection to the mother so that she can't catch whooping cough and pass it on to her baby when the baby's small, but it also protects the baby by a transfer of transplacental antibodies. So NIAC recommended the vaccine for pregnant women in 2013, and uh, we provide it from uh, the HSE in terms of the vaccine free to all, uh, pregnant, all GPs to give to pregnant women. And as we've heard, an outbreak was then declared in the end of October 2018, and then there was an outbreak code so GPs can claim payment for uh, giving the, uh, the, the booster X vaccine to pregnant women since November. So no pregnant woman should uh, be paying for her pertussis vaccine. She should be able to get that free of charge. So why are we giving it from 16 to 36 weeks? You might remember that when the recommendation first came out, it was 27 to 36 weeks, and then that was changed in September 2016. So now, 
uh, the recommendation is women get it from 16 to 36 weeks, and that's because there was data and, and studies showing that the optimal neonatal pertussis antibody concentrations happened when the vaccine was given earlier in pregnancy. It also has some practical advantages as well, so there's more opportunities to the woman to be offered the vaccine. She's coming in more to the hospital and the GP practice. She has more opportunities for people to remind her to get vaccinated and to have that vaccine. Obviously, some babies are already born at 27 weeks, so it gives some protection for premature babies that otherwise wouldn't have been protected. And also, uh, it's important to know that if the woman misses the vaccine after 36 weeks, you can still give her the vaccine. It will uh, prevent her, her getting the pertussis herself and then give some indirect protection to the baby, but it won't have this placental uh, antibody transfer effect. So in terms of giving the Tdap vaccine, you shouldn't give the Tdap vaccine if there's a history of anaphylaxis to that vaccine or its constituents. As I've said, the same for every other vaccine. NIAC recommends that there's no interval uh, required to be left between the Tdap vaccine and any other tetanus-containing vaccine the woman has, for example, if she's had a tetanus-prone wound. You can give Tdap exactly at the same time as the flu vaccine or any other inactive vaccine you're giving in pregnancy, but we would recommend you don't delay so that you can give them together. Give the flu when they're eligible for the flu and the Tdap once they become 16 weeks pregnant. So make sure the woman gets her, both her vaccines at the recommended time. And because the protection is from transfer of antibodies from the mother to the baby, it's important that the woman gets a Tdap dose of, uh, dose of the Tdap vaccine every pregnancy. So as we go forward, uh, people might say, well, I had it in my last pregnancy, though she still needs another vaccine in her next pregnancy so she can protect that baby. And that was all I was going to say. Thank you.